Thank you, and welcome to this week's session of Midweek Money Matters, where we're talking especially about elder abuse and exploitation in honor of June being Elder Abuse Awareness Month. And today I'm so excited to have my boss and um, colleague, Tina Katzlis, on the line with us today, where we're going to be talking about how we can protect our loved ones from financial exploitation. So, Without further ado, I do want to make sure that I remind you that we are recording today's session and I ask that you place any questions that you may have in the chat box and we will open it up to live Q&A at the end of the session today. So there you go, Tina, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katrina. I'm Christina Kotzlis or Tina, and I work for the Education and Outreach Office along with my colleague Katrina. I'm especially happy to be presenting today. June 15 is recognized internationally as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. So we wanted to recognize that with an important presentation. Now, Susan is saying she that, that she can't hear me. So. Oh, no. Can Lorna hear me? Lorna shaking her head. Yes. Yep. My volume is turned all the way up. Katrina, can you hear me well? I can, but I just, that was me asking Susan. Okay. How about now? Is now any better? I'm hearing you okay now. Okay. Susan, is that any better? Katrina is loud, she said, which is great. We like to hear that. Susan, can you tell us if you can hear me better? Yes, I have it up close now. Sounds very faint to her. Hmm. Susan, is this better? I'm going to try to talk really loud. Katrina, do you hear me talking a bit louder? I do. I hear you a little bit louder. Okay. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to speak more powerfully. So next slide, please. And as employees of the Pennsylvania Department of Banking and Securities, we are issuing this disclaimer that the information we provide is a service and not a legal interpretation. So let's move on to the goals for this training. We want to prevent financial exploitation because at some point in our lives, unfortunately, we're either gonna hear about it or know somebody that has been touched by elder financial exploitation. We may have aging relatives, parents, neighbors, or friends who could become victims. And during today's presentation, we want you to be familiar with what this looks like how it's perpetrated, and what you can do about it. Next slide. So what is financial elder financial exploitation? Put simply, it's the illegal or improper use of an older adult's funds, properties, or assets. Unfortunately, it does tend to happen often that family members do that to each other, but there are also telemarketers, unscrupulous investment promoters, and even strangers that commit elder fraud. The important thing for us is to understand what it looks like. Next slide. So the extent of, of abuse in Pennsylvania, as you can see, is fairly rampant and it's very worrying. There's a lot of fraud taking place, a lot of fraud against senior citizens. We work with the Department of Aging and interestingly enough, in their most recent surveys, financial exploitation is the most frequently reported form of elder abuse. That's fascinating to me, that financial exploitation is that rampant that it has surpassed being reported even above caregiver neglect, which I know we hear a lot about, and self-neglect. But the most frequently substantiated forms of fraud Self-neglect comes first, then caregiver neglect, then financial exploitation. What this tells us is that sometimes financial exploitation is harder to prove. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go on in this presentation. 
So let's look at a graph here. I know it, it's kind of a, a boring looking graph, but it actually has a lot of information on it that's important. So we're gonna start with the right, the health related effects of aging. What do I mean by that? There's a reason that many are calling elder financial exploitation the crime of the 21st century. If we look at this combination of factors, starting with the health related effects of aging, by that we mean the aging process can bring about cognitive or physical changes that can elevate the risks of elder financial abuse. And we're gonna talk about those cognitive and physical changes a little later. Then we go into the green, the fin financial and retirement trends. What we mean by that is that the wealth and assets that the elderly have accumulated throughout their lives, that nest egg that they rely on for their retirement, that often becomes a target for con artists. And then we go into the blue, the demographic trends, which is we're an aging population. And this lends a special urgency to the problems of elder financial exploitation as our population and the aging population increases. Let's look more closely in our next slide about what we mean when we bring all of these factors together. So let's think about some of our older friends or family members and relatives and what they're dealing with on a daily basis. Now, this slide was created before COVID. So we know there was social isolation before, but imagine the kind of social isolation that took place during COVID. There were telemarketing calls, tons of mail solicitations and email solicitations. Imagine that and layer on top of it, the transitions many seniors are experiencing at this time in their lives. They may have a collapsing social network because friends and family may be dying or they may have to move from their home they lived in for 60 years to a new and unfamiliar environment, like an assisted living community. That's a huge change in a person's life. On top of that, maybe there was a recent knee replacement or some type of surgery that put the senior on new medications. That can have an effect on their decision-making. Now, that could be temporary, and sometimes we don't even think about that. Then think about the critical financial decisions that older adults are being asked to make at a time in their lives when their ability to do so may become impaired. Remember that third item on our graph, the financial and retirement trends, the one in blue? At a time in their lives where there is so much transition taking place, they are becoming more and more responsible for making complex financial decisions. And any wrong move could mean the loss of their life savings. The problem is they have limited time to recover. And that's what makes this type of abuse so devastating. For these reasons, we are out there, not just educating the public, but also financial professionals. And Katrina, thank you. You are moving in the right direction because here in this graph, I wanted to show you diminished capacity. It's a spectrum. Remember, I talked about how medications can cause temporary cognitive changes. So the aging adult may age their brain. This is a picture of the brain. It may age normally to the left. Some people have some type of mild cognitive impairment. What does that mean? It means that there may be some memory changes. They may not be severe enough to interfere with your day-to-day -day life and usual activities. You can still go out and golf with your friends or have tea. But when it comes to financial decisions, you may have a harder time and need assistance. And then of course, there's Alzheimer's disease, which is noticeable to severe memory loss. The purpose of this slide is to show you that it is a spectrum. And hopefully more people will age normally, but, we have to look to the right side and be prepared for those that may not. Next slide. I wanna remind you that a person can live an entire life with no diminished capacity, but this slide is just here to show you that people that suffer from these types of dementia are going to need assistance. And what's worse is that they may be being defrauded and not even know it. So who is there to protect them? That's why it's so important that we protect 
these vulnerable older adults, since they may not be able to protect themselves. And I'd like to follow up with, unfortunately, elder financial abuse, it really can kill. A recent TrueLink survey estimates that seniors lose about $36.48 billion a year to financial abuse. Now that's more than 12 times what was previously reported. And unfortunately, this doesn't just take a physical toll and mental toll, it can be life-threatening. I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Katrina to tell you some real life examples of what we're talking about here. Thank you so much, Tina, for that great overview of why it's so important that we all understand cognitive impairment and how our brains change over time. And it was really helpful to see the impact that it has on the people that we love and care about. So I do want to tell a few, three different stories now. First story is about Marjorie Jones. Marjorie Jones was always well known for her financial capability. She lived alone and she was an 80, she was 82 years old and legally blind. But her family didn't realize that something was happening with her until it was too late. So it started with a phone call that some that Marjorie had won a sweepstakes prize. They told her that she could collect the winnings as soon as she paid the taxes and fees. Once she wired that first set of money, the person kept calling her back over and over and over. Um, and that, that's the reality is that scammers will continue to push individuals to continue to send more money until they finally either have nothing left or someone steps in. So Marjorie's family was the same way. Her family didn't realize that there was something wrong until she asked a niece if she could borrow some money. This was a person who had always been admired for her financial independence. And when her niece said she didn't have the money to lend, Marjorie took it a step further. And when she had nothing left, Marjorie took her own life. And she had cashed in, not only spent her life savings, but she had cashed in her life insurance policy and took out a reverse mortgage and then went on to try to borrow money from family. And the reality was that when the family went in to go through Marjorie's effects, they found that she had $69 left in her account. $69 from a woman who had always been well known for her financial capabilities. Not only that, they found dozens of phone numbers in her cell phone, and they found bags, literally bags, grocery bags, filled with receipts for money that Marjorie had wire transferred over the course of a few weeks. That, to me, is a prime example of how an older adult becoming a victim of financial fraud or exploitation can end up losing their life. But I wanna tell you about another story. This story is about Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith is a man that I met at a senior expo. And he says to me, Katrina, I know it's a scam. He says, I have sent $70,000 for a mail order bride. He says, I know it's a scam, but I keep sending money because maybe, just maybe, I'll send money to the right place. Now, that was terrifying to me, but the reality for me was that I, it wasn't my decision. It wasn't, I didn't have to know if Mr. Smith was financial, had mental, was incapacitated. 
That was not my concern. My only concern was to get the information to the area agency on aging. And they happened to be at this location. So I was able to tell them about the conversation. So the really good news is I don't have to know whether or not Mr. Smith has, has the mental capacity to make that financial decision or if, because the reality is we all can choose to make bad financial choices. And it's not my decision. I don't have to know if he's capable or not. All I have to do is know where to report. And that's what today's session really aims to cover. But before we move on, I do want to talk about um, Ruth. Um, Ruth Mitchell, um, you know, elder finance exploitation doesn't always end, end a life but it certainly can absolutely change a life. Um, and so I want to talk about Ruth and her husband who became victims of a Ponzi scheme by someone that they knew and trusted immeasurably. Head up, head up. 65-year-old Ruth Mitchell was retired after decades as a professional skater and coach. That's what it's all So why is she back on the ice? The more I skate, the more I can forget about what Barry Corkin did to us. So perhaps if I do 10 hour days, I'll forget about him altogether. <laughs> I don't know. Do you slide the bagel in here? Ruth's husband, Len, was also retired after 55 years as an architect. But now he too has gone back to work in his garage wood shop. We are going to uh, put those on eBay the Mitchell's dream of a leisurely, fun-filled retirement was dashed when Len Mitchell's CPA and close personal friend Barry Corkin stole the couple's entire $100,000 nest egg. It was just like putting a dagger in my heart. I figured, oh, that can't be. He was their accountant and did their tax returns uh, and gave them advice. They trusted. He'd known some of these people for years. And then all of a sudden, he decides that here's a way for him to make a lot of money. Imagine having worked hard and saved forever and suddenly having someone that you know and you think is a friend and they turn around and wipe you out. Mr. Corkin ended up stealing something like eight or seven or eight million dollars from different people. And what I thought was, um, what I think makes this story unique is that um, Ruth Mitchell and her husband actually were from Pennsylvania. They were from the Pittsburgh area. So, um, you know, we've seen a wide variety of stories. We've seen three different stories today. And all of them tell us a different perspective of elder. So I'm Head up. Talk Head up. about how we can start some conversations. Um, you know, we can start a conversation with someone that we love and care about. Hey, mom, I just read this headline um, and I wanted to talk to you about what I heard. Or, hey, Uncle Joe, I noticed that you haven't been coming around as much. We don't see you as often as we used to. Is everything okay? Is there something going on? Um, or even grandma, I saw a webinar at work. In my world, I have a mother-in-law who's recently widowed, and these are conversations that I am always trying to make sure that I cover because it's important for us to, to talk about elder exploitation and the reality of how it can happen so that we don't forget. And if we keep it in our minds, it will stay with us. So what can we do? You know, we can have those conversations, ask those open-ended kind of questions, you know, tell me about what's going on. Um, we also need to step back and think about what some of those red flags are. You know, if you frequently have, you know, maybe you have a standing coffee date with Aunt, Aunt Frances or whatever, and suddenly she starts to miss those. Or maybe she's not taking as good of care of herself as she used to. Um, or maybe suddenly she has a friend that has just appeared and is very active in their life. Those are all red flags that we need to be aware of so that 
we can start to ask some of those questions. Um, as we all know that, you know, over the last year, year and a half, we have been so incredibly isolated that the reality is that older adults are falling for um, more and more of these types of scams because of the fact that they haven't been able to do the things that they used to do. So we need to be aware of this even more now. We do have a publication that's called the Elder Abuse Prevention Guide, and you can get it from our website. As always, if you'd like a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation, I will be happy to send those out. There is a, a, a link contained right in the PowerPoint presentation, and I'm happy to send those if you'd like them. But this really does sort of outline some of those things that we need to be aware of that can also help us to start some of those more difficult conversations with our loved ones. But we really want to know is if we think that something isn't right, you know, I go back to, it's not my job to know if he's cognitively impaired. I just need to know how to report it. So there are mandatory reporters um, most of us are not mandatory reporters, but anybody who's employed by a facility that um, works in elder um, elder care is required to report. Um, but the rest of us are all voluntary reporters. If we think something isn't right, we can always report it. Um, so that's the really great thing about being able to, you know, make those calls and talk about what we suspect may be happening. Um, so you can always call the Pennsylvania Adult Protective Services number. That's at 800-490-8505. Um, and that is typically one of the first places that we want to go. If you if there if the older adult, the family member that you care about is in immediate danger, Please, the first thing you need to do is to dial 911. Um, if you're concerned about the financial well being, you're concerned that the person that you're close to is being exploited financially, particularly through investments, you can always call our office at 800 PA Banks. Those of you who have been on with me, you know how much I think we can offer because we have people on the phone who are answering those calls. And they're happy to provide you with the resources that you need. Um, some of the other resources that I think are really important are legal services. Um, senior law can be reached at that 877 number. If you're not sure how to contact your county's agency on aging, you can go to aging.pa.gov and you can type in your county and it will give you the contact information directly to your county area agency on aging. When you call the adult protective services number, it's going to route you to the to the county that your phone number is listed in. Um, so, but if you call that number, they will get you to the right county very quickly. Um, and then there's the domestic violence hotline and the sexual assault hotline, because unfortunately, those are realities too for some older adults. It's not just about the money, it's about the violence and, and, and the sexual assault that may come with that exploitation. You know, sometimes they go hand in hand, sometimes they don't, but having the resources so that we know exactly where to go is really critical. Um, there are other phenomenal resources out there. We just have to know where to look. Um, and those of you, again, who have been on with me before know that having those resources is so critically important. So go to your favorite search engine and type in senior services in whatever county you live in. Um, contact that county agency on aging. 211 is another really great resource. You can dial 211 from any county in Pennsylvania and the trained professional on that line is going to ask some questions and then provide you with resources, telephone numbers, and other things that may be available in your county. They specifically are aware of some of the more localized opportunities that maybe churches or other uh, nonprofit organizations may offer. So they're a really great resource. 
as well as your local community action. Every county in um, the United States has some form of community action representation, and they have some also some great resources. So, you know, like I said, just go into your favorite search engine and search out for any of these resources and you will find a plethora of information. And, you know, if you have difficulty with this, you can always contact me. You can contact, and I'm gonna provide the information. Um, you can contact us um, by email and we can help you to find the resources that you need. So with that, we've got about three more minutes for questions. Um, I do want to invite you to Contact us at informed at pa.gov if you have questions or concerns. Um, you can also contact me. Um, and I'm going to stop the recording now so that if we have.